Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. Well, it's a great privilege to have Mary Barnes here, right here in the studio this time. And, um, and Mary Barnes is a legend in, in her, of herself because she, I don't know how she discovered Alzheimer's. Well, she's told the story before. But Alzheimer's and your name are synonymous, at least here in South Florida, with what you saw. You were such a visionary about something that was really going to take over and nobody was even listening or caring. And that's how I always think of you. You know, I always say that to you. Thank you, Anita. And it's always glad. I'm always so pleased to be with you. And um, life goes on. Uh, to think that we as Alzheimer's Community Care have been in existence now for 20 years. 20 years. Doesn't Talk about aging possible. in place. And I... And when you think of the movie, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, and you think of, you know, uh, if we weren't here, what would have not have happened? And uh, the drive and the advocacy and the actual ex- execution of what we would call a dementia-specific uh, local specialized health care provider, this is what we've come into. Well, let me answer your question. What would have happened is they would do more research, they would do more things, but there would be no one there to put their arms and hugs for these people, for the families. That's what I see as, as the difference. I think that what we've been able to teach our society and our policymakers, whether you're talking about in Tallahassee or locally or when we're talking about in Washington, you've got to say care and cure. There was this understanding and this thought, and it was a wonderful thought, that we would find a cure in a matter of five years. And that was way back in 1979, 1980. You did. When, and, and, did that really? was the, and that was what was said. There's going to be a cure. It's right around the corner. It's right over the vista. You know, so the, the, the focus in on specialized Alzheimer's or dementia-specific care wasn't an issue at that time. But our caregivers were going to the doctors and they were going to different areas in the community and they weren't getting the help. And, you know, I've always believed and our organization always believed if there's not any help, there's no hope. And the hope was at that time, again, that we were going to find a cure. Well, now we're back. We're now in 2017. We're no more clear closer today than to, to find a cure. But in all fairness to all this research has been going on, we kind of know what we, what we don't know. We kind of know now that in the direction that we were going in has not produced the cure that everybody thought it was going to be. And I also believe that everyone's kind of gotten more sophisticated in the way this brain works. It's not going to be one magic bullet. It's like cancer. You don't have one magic treatment when there's cancer. Way back when John Wayne was in the, um, in the shootist, and when he went up to John, uh, John uh, when he went up to um, Stuart, Jimmy Stewart and said, Doc, what have I got? And he said he got the cancer. He didn't say he had lung cancer. He didn't have, say you had colon cancer. He didn't say any of that. Now, look at what they're doing with cancer. I mean, they've got specialized uh, treatments as far as the uh, laser when it comes to the granules with, uh, you know, chemotherapy and radiation and everything. And you're actually now being able to target. And they're actually targeting that disease, that cancer, that mass, whatever. And we're actually actually put it into a level. The federal government has identified it as being maintenance now. Who would have ever thought that cancer would have been a maintenance disease. So let me ask you about Alzheimer's then. Are people living longer with it because the medications? I think people are living longer knowing what they have, which is a big, big help as well. And you're go- the baby boomers are affected now. You know, the baby boomers are not going to go quiet into the night. They have never gone quiet into the night through a whole bulge of, of uh, look what they did, the baby boomers did to education for their children when things were, when they were going through that. So there's, the baby boomers are now into aging and they are going to demand and want much more care. And they're also going to want to see that their needs are addressed as well. And that's where we come into full fruition. I mean, let me ask you a question. What if money was not a problem, an object? You know, let's say that anything, any money could be found. Would they then find a cure for Alzheimer's? Is it funding that's keeping this from from having? I I think it's a matter of testing. And that's what finding a cure is all about. 
uh, to find out exactly, and there would be many more uh, research labs specializing in just the Alzheimer's disease because, I, and, and there would be, I would not promise you that they would find something in 10 years. I would not promise you that they would find something in 15 years or mm-hmm. five years. I couldn't, I couldn't say that they could promise that. What they're not even looking at really a cure at this point, they're trying to look at ways to slow it up. And one of the ways that we have proven to slow it up is having the kind of environment that where the caregiver and the patient can survive in the community, have the kind of therapeutic interventions, other types of assistance to get everyone safe and lowering the stress level and being able to keep their home routine in the community uh, to live out the disease. So give us an example. Let's take uh, Mary Jones. Mary Jones has a, um, she has a uh, husband, she has a, a daughter, son-in-law, family, and now she's been diagnosed with dementia, Alzheimer's. Tell us when they go to your, when she goes to your program. Explain all this. Okay, to us. the the real obstacle at this point, we are still getting people too late. Okay, denial is huge, not only with the patient but with the family as well. So that's a big barrier that we've got to overcome, that when you see something a little different, please reach out to help. Because here's what researchers have found, that when you start seeing the behavior, they probably have already had it for 20 or 30 years. So that's what they found. Really? So are we going to start seeing different types of ways of us recognizing the disease process? I'm sure that's where research is going. So we got to get to families sooner. We got to get to families before families break down, before there's internal uh, types of financial abuse or other types of things that that divide families. Because this is one thing I do know that when the patient does start passing away, because we are going to lose the patient, we don't want to lose the caregiver. That's the big impact that we have in the community. And once that end end stage comes, that both caregiver and patient want everybody around that bed. But if we don't intercede and work together, because when, when this disease is not evident, you don't need us, but when it comes into, into existence and everybody's recognizing it. So the first thing we do is we help the families understand what are you, what is the diagnosis? And it doesn't work for us to say the word dementia because dementia is a symptom. And so often they come into our, well, my husband doesn't have Alzheimer's, he has dementia. Okay, that doesn't tell us anything. So we really got to work out, what is it, Lewy body's disease? Is it vascular dementia? Is it uh, frontal temporal lobe, like a Pick's disease? Or other types of, other types of uh, neurological disorder that maybe could be curable. It could be the thyroid. It could be other things. So that's why before everything gets very expensive, before everything gets very complicated, let's find out what we're dealing with because the pathology of that, if you don't know, you're not going to be able to do a good plan, a care plan, which can also be expensive if you don't know, if you don't know what you, what you need and what you have to have as far as the different uh, medications go. I mean, what works, what doesn't work. If you've got vascular dementia, you know, Aricet's not going to work. It's a waste of money. But it's very promising then. You may go in thinking it's, it's Alzheimer's and it may not be. If you can have a tumor. Pro- you can have a tumor. There's other ways. So to stay away from that doctor and to stay away from not getting the right kind of diagnosis is a very bad thing. And is it easy to get the right kind of diagnosis? Well, in some scenarios, yes. In other scenarios, no. I mean, there's this big fight in Washington and all that about you don't need to get unnecessary tests and everything. Well, uh, when it comes to trying to find out what you're suffering with and you've got all the symptoms, you better believe it's important to find out what it is. So you need to kind of having the testing. Then you've got research as well. And there are some research, research, um, go, research going out there that can be helpful for the future. But we've got to start and recruit actual participants now. And okay, okay, so now we have this family and they've come in and they've had the... And we identify yes, the stage. That is this awesome. Oh, and the stage. We indi- identify the stage of where they're at. We try to make sure of what kind of backup 
the family has. And that also helps very much into knowing how long they're going to be able to live in the community. Because if you've got a caregiver that's got a, a terrible heart heart problem and other kind, types of medical issues, we got to put the oxygen on the caregiver to try to help out and say, okay, what's the future? Because here's the big $64,000 question we always ask. What happens to your loved one if something happens to you? Has all the legal stuff been worked out? Has all the directives and five wishes and all of those other types of legal processes, have they been identified? And I know so many times the kids, the children, what people want to help. But because of our culture and we try to be independent and we don't want to burden the kids and we don't want to burden the rest of the family, we just keep putting it off until all of a sudden we have the caregiver in the hospital who should have been taking care of themselves in the first place, and guess what? There's no options. Because the longer you wait, the less the options are. I hope our listeners are paying attention to what Mary Barnes is saying. Let me tell you, Mary Barnes is the CEO of excuse me, Alzheimer's Community Care. And the Alzheimer's Community Care was founded in 1996 by a group of local residents in Florida who were concerned about the growing number of people affected by Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. And that was really led by our champion, Mary Barnes. So if you want more information, please do call their office, and that's 683-2700. And and, uh, just put a 561 in front of it, 683-2700, or uh, just go to their website, which is alzcare.org. ALZcare.org. Okay, so continue. So now you have, let's say you have a uh, a nice organiz- You have a nice family. They've heard what you said, and they. W- how do they get that their loved one there? You do pick them up. Do they bring them? We there? arrange what happens? transportation, but <clears throat> here's what brings them here, because you have a, a very productive, very energetic person all their life that were either the provider or ran the household. So now all of a sudden this loved one's starting to have what we call an empty day. A what? An empty day. Even though... Well, you and I would like an empty day some days. Yeah. <laughs> that's, an, that's another issue. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway, an empty day. And this dynamic, this, this caring person that took care of the family and everything, you don't want that kind of life for that person. So we introduced the concept of our specialized al- licensed Alzheimer's daycare service which brings in the stimulation, which brings in the socialization, which brings in all other types of um, therapeutic exercises and physical as well as musical and as well as other types. Something's going on all the time. Why is that important? Because it gets that person not to have an empty day anymore, anymore. If they're losing weight, they start gaining weight again because of the fact nobody wants to eat alone. And the caregiver can only do so much for recreation. They've got to do all the other stuff that takes to run a life and for two people. So they have a chance to have peace of mind, to go off and do. And I and I say the caregiver is more for the patient. Now, there may be a school of thought that's against that. But I happen to believe our job is to give a quality of life for that patient. And there's also times we bring the families together. We did 740 uh, Thanksgiving dinners this last time in all our sites throughout the three counties. And you know what? For some of those families, that might have been the only Thanksgiving dinner they would have had with other people. Usually you always have your family around, but no, not down here in Florida. So that kind of fun, that kind of camaraderie, you know, camaraderie and and just getting a family together and friends together is what we try to do for the patient and for the caregiver. Now, Okay, so now they, they're having uh, very interesting days, so it's not right. an empty day. So then we go into preparing because we know that it's advancing. We're going to try to slow it up, which we, which we do, and we stabilize the uh, disease process for a very long time. We plateau. We've got... We've got a patient in our daycare in, um, in Pahokee that has been with us for 17 years. Her cognition score is two, but she gets up every day because she has this routine. 
She has this routine. Now, unfortunately or fortunately, we happen to think it's the natural way of life because we're not going to get out of this world alive. So as the disease all of a sudden starts, starts not plateauing, but starting to advance very quickly, this person is not languishing in a nursing home. She's had a very, very um, active life. And a lot of people don't see an Alzheimer's patient in that active life. But we, you can see it in our daycare all the time. And we are now working with uh, our major universities to have nurses. We have a practicum nursing program where these nurses now can go in our daycare and work on the floor. They didn't have that option. We're doing it with FAU. We're doing it with Palm Beach State. We're doing it with Palm Beach Atlantic. We're doing it with Kaiser and Indian River. They have cream of the, they, they have fantastic nursing programs, but we have supplanted and we are doing this with our, our nurses. And you know what? They like it. They're getting, you know, I didn't think of working with uh, geriatric patients. I like this because they can see how vital our patients are. Even yeah. though they've got that diagnosis of maybe uh, Lewy bodies or they might have the diagnosis. So we focused on, we're focusing on the medical community because we feel that we've taken care of the law enforcement because of the Silver Alert program. Now we need doctors. We need doctors to embrace this. And, and so we're focusing on, we've got this conference coming up, which is March 16th and oh, 17th. Yes. This is so important. I do want to talk about and, that. And the conference, where our star this year is going to be uh, James uh, Galvin, Dr. Galvin, out of FAU. He is a specialist and a researcher in Lewy body's disease, a very misunderstood and mi- very misdiagnosed or undiagnosed disease. And so he's going to be speaking to our doctors because we're having a physician's dinner and we're giving out CMEs, one CME, so any doctor free of charge and we've got a benefactor that's underwriting the whole cost of that dinner. Yeah, CME is because doctors have to get certain credits that's right. every time. I have to tell you, and I don't know if I said that before, <clears throat> my mother was diagnosed with diagnosed with a Lewy body. And that was like, what are you talking about, Lewy body? What is it? And I'm talking about 2003. Right, right. Very. And I, I had no idea what that was, but I knew she was having hallucinations. And that's right. I, and I realized... It's, it's a lot of delirium, and you know it's a crossover. It's got a combination of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, too. So you already know the rigidness and the, the, the uh, possibility of falling will increase as the disease progresses. But Dr. Galvin has come up with a tool, and he's got it right on his website at FAU, that you as a practitioner or as someone taking care of, um, you know, like we do in our nurses and that, we can actually do this, um, this survey. And there's about five or eight questions. And it does, we're not diagnosing, but we'll see signs. And then we can get, and we, we, we tell the um, uh, family of what we're suspecting. And when they go to the doctor and he really looks at everything and he says, you know, there's a possibility this may be it. So, I mean, he has brought many gifts to the world of dementia-specific care providers to be able to get this tool because we can get help, the right kind of help to the family sooner because quality of care depends on the diagnosis. And the quality of care will keep the caregivers in a better shape. Right. They know because... As I remember, my mother thought there were people walking around and they were coming, going to come and get her. But I hadn't really been able to find out any information about this right. time. It was very early. And I'd been at the North right. Broward, you know, um, I used to call memory it. Memory disorder, Broward. I used to call it the memory center. Yep. I used to take yep. my mother there to get a better memory, not a memory disorder. But you have been such a pioneer. You must be so thrilled with yourself. I want to, let's dwell on getting people to come to this. Yeah. So it is, uh, and it's getting your today. doctors to come to the physician's dinner would be terrific. You can go right on our website, which is, as you eloquently said, alscare.org, and get them registered. Because, and again, it's free of charge. They'll get a CME. It's going to be held at the Kravis Center. Uh, it's right across the street from the convention center, which is our big convention. Our big conference is going to go on that day as well. But if we can get more and more doctors, to hear such gifted speakers like and such talented researchers like Dr. James Galvin, I think it's, he would, they would learn a lot. Now, during the day, the two days, he'll be conducting, he'll be our keynote speaker on Friday. So, and he's also going to be doing a workshop. So we're so lucky 
to have this this type of talent. So it's in Thursday our midst. and Friday. Yep. And it's uh, the 16th. The physician, this is the Physician's Day. Yeah. Okay. But it's the, the day that we want people to come. Um, the actual convention, uh, there are people coming. I've been to it. It is just spellbinding. Is actually going to be... Um, it's going to be the sixth, 17th. 16th and 17th. 16th. It's going 17th. to be the physician's dinner is the night of the 16th. Yeah, but during the day. Is what going to have the conference. Yeah, the convention. Yep. 16th and 17th. And it is over there at the <clears throat> the Palm Beach, um, the convention center. So if you want to make a reservation, you have to just get in touch with them. And as I said, uh, you can call them at 561-683-2700. Um, do they buy tickets to go? Not, when not they to register, the they register on. But let me just say this, that for our caregivers, we get grants. We do all kinds of things to make it reasonable. And it's for $50 for two days. It's fabulous. You can't get much, you can't get much leaner than that. We really want our caregivers there to really learn about the hope that's going on out there and the kind of help. And there's going to be 60 exhibitors. And they're going to be able to find out what home health is all about. They're going to be able to find out what long-term care means. They're going to be find out what assisted living. We'll have the sheriff's office there to talk about the silver alert, to talk about we're going to have people with the, uh, the part of our safety net, which is the transmitters. We have, because we have a grant for that, giving transmitters in case people are very, very, what we call um, uh, professional uh, elopers. You know, they just get some patients, they just want to go home. They right, just but you have there. respite there. That's we the, do respite as well. Very important for yep. people for those that are right. very unfamiliar with uh, that kind of service, and they're just getting their feet wet, so to speak, about understanding what this diagnosis is. And I'll be honest with you, what we're seeing more and more, and this is where the care, this is where the baby boomers come in. We have somebody approaching and saying, "I have Alzheimer's. I've just been diagnosed. I want to learn more." That's our that's our patient of of today. Now I haven't kept up with Dottie Carson. How is she? Doing? Dottie has been on a treatment, and I've been told by others that she's doing very well. So I mean, let's, let's explain, face it, Dottie. Let's explain who Dottie Carson is. Dottie's got a will that uh, Dottie started. Dottie worked for us back um, back in nineteen. Uh, let's see, oh uh, seven, two no two thousand and seven. And she was our development person, and she was always very creative. And always, and she had a father who had Alzheimer's, and he was in uh, in, in New Louisiana. Orleans, and New she Orleans, had to yep, keep going back and forth with a lot yep. of brothers and sisters. But and 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 she always had this fear that it would happen that she would get Alzheimer's. So that's why she was working, and she's been in the field of working for Alzheimer's for a good many years. And then all of a sudden. I got a call, and uh, she told me that she had Alzheimer's. But that wasn't going to, she wasn't going to uh, roll over and do nothing. So uh, she's been working with uh, a researcher uh, in the community. And People um, should know, I think she's only, what, 50? She's, five or what she's, is she? she got it when she, when was, she was 50. Yeah, she oh. was 58. And she, we had her do a video. And we did a video, and, and she uses the video for her purposes, and we use the video for education, educating that you're not just 72 or 83 when you get Alzheimer's. They have this picture of an Alzheimer's patient, and we're starting to see more and younger, younger people. We have a, uh Alzheimer's patient that's 54. We have one that's 48. In Didn't our daycare. Rita Hayworth, who, who was the Rita star? Hayworth was... It was Rita Hayworth, yeah. yeah, it was Rita Hayworth, I guess, that made the most startling news when they finally, as a, as a um, celebrity, as a movie star. And the heartbreaker was for the family was when she was, she was into the disease and she was on a flight, an airplane flight. And uh, they arrested her when she got, when she was getting off the flight because they thought she was drunk. And in reality, she wasn't. She had Alzheimer's. And she was very, very, she got very anxiety, a very, uh, and so, but they didn't know that at the time. The family didn't know at the time until they got it diagnosed. And so that was the first big surprise about finding out that what this disease was doing to people. And I'm not quite sure what age she was at that time. I'd have to really get. I thought she was in her 50s. I think she was. I think she was, 
in her mid fifties. And uh, of course, being a movie star, you know, they made a big. Uh, and I think she was married to the Aga Khan at the time. I think it was a very. It was very. Uh, yeah, it was. It was. It was a. It was a, it was a scandal at the time. Yeah. And I think that's where we're still fighting the fact that people can be shamed or stigmatized and everything. And it's not that way at all anymore. I mean, really. But there is that. I, I got to be. I got to be honest. You know, sometimes there is that that image out there, and we're trying very hard to combat that. Well, President stories, Reagan helped. Well, stories like uh, Glenn Campbell, the movie with Glenn Campbell, right. and the documentary, that was real. HBO did that. And I was very, very impressed with the, uh, with the uh, real authenticity of uh, what went. He, and he probably got, did this documentary, documentary when he was in his, the mid-stage of the disease process. So your life has really been a major challenge, but you should have medals and buttons all over your clothing because, as you said so well, it's not that you were able to do research yourself or that you were able to cure Alzheimer's, but what you did is you put your arms around the people, you hugged them with lots of information, lots of places for them to go for help. And so you really should should know that what you did was enormous and i hope that that you appreciate yourself because we do i thank you and Anita, we do we appreciate uh, I just you. i just want to say i do have medals on my chest and they're, they're called the well, silver, the silver know, alert there's a silver alert there's the specialized and, alzheimer's daycare no, there's and, the conference and we've run out of time mary but you know what i'm going to go to the conference and i Good. hope everyone else will march the 16th and the 17th we never have enough time because you could do this for <laughs> five hours but I'm so glad that you were I'm here. I'm so glad to see you. So too. everybody, uh, please d- don't don't put your head in the sand. Go get help. Go attend the beautiful conference. It's the 2017 Alzheimer's Educational Conference. Thanks, Mary, so much. Thank you.